Hello there, today I will bring you the most detailed video on how to build a PC in Singapore, JB, and some say, no, I'm not gonna do that. Southeast Asia. Everything will be included here from choosing the parts to building to software and all the tips and tricks that you're gonna need to know. Reason why I say Singapore and Southeast Asia is because we don't have one giant store that sells everything like a micro center in USA. We have malls like Simming Square in Singapore, Low Hyatt Plaza in KL, and Pantip Plaza in Bangkok. I know Bangkok have one mall, Palatium Plaza? I'm not, not quite sure. These are malls with many small stores and resellers. So most people in Southeast Asia will do their research and pick the parts first before going down to the stores. So let's get to the first step, researching and picking the parts. These are the components you need to build a PC. To start, let me explain what the central processing unit is or CPU. Your CPU is like the brain of the PC that is tasked with general computing. CPU have different model numbers and can be difficult for people to understand. Here's how the numbering system works for Intel CPUs. The first letter and number you will see is an I3, 5, 7 or 9. This tells you which tier the CPU falls into. The higher the number, the higher the tier. The more computing power, the more expensive it is. For example, an i9 CPU belongs to the high range that can cost up to $1,000, while an i3 CPU belongs in the entry range that can go as cheap as $200. Then you have a dash with the next two numbers that will tell you the generation it's from. Intel's latest CPUs are from the 12th generation, so you notice they all begin with 12. The third number differentiates the CPU in their tiers. The higher the number, the better the CPU. For example, the 12500 and the 12600 are both i5 CPUs, but the 12600 is better and more expensive. Sometimes there is a letter attached to the end of the CPU number, either K, F, or KF. The letter K means it's unlocked, meaning you can overclock the CPU. And the F means there's no integrated graphics. So if you're gonna get a GPU anyway, then a CPU with an F will save you some money. So let me give you an example. I have here the Intel Core i9-12900KF. i9-12900 means it's the best of the best that Intel can offer. K means it's unlocked. And F means there is no integrated graphics. So the interesting thing about the 12th gen Intel CPUs is that it features traditional performance core or P cores on all all the 12th gen CPUs, but on the i5-12600 and higher, both P and the new efficiency core or E cores are used. The new E cores help alleviate the workload by performing the smaller tasks so that the P cores can fully dedicate to other more CPU intensive tasks resulting in better performance overall. If you do video editing, 3D animation, play CPU intensive games like CSGO, Valorant, CT Skylines or any AI intensive game, you should consider getting a better CPU. I'll go more in depth later on because it ties together with the next thing, the GPU. The GPU is a specialist processor that mainly deals with graphics. In general, the more you spend on the GPU, the more performance you're gonna get. Basically, to differentiate CPU and GPU, the CPU is like the jack of all trades and the GPU is a master of one. Let's start off by understanding the GPU numbers and models and let's use Nvidia's GPUs as an example. So the first three letters, you will either get a GTX or an RTX. And the difference between RTX and GTX is RTX has a few features that the GTX doesn't have. Ray tracing, DLSS, and NVIDIA Reflex. Then we go on to the next two numbers that indicates the generation of the card. Currently, NVIDIA's latest generation is the 3000 series and therefore, the latest card will begin with three. So the last generation is the 2000 series I have here, the RTX 2070 Super. The last two numbers indicate the range of the GPU. The higher the number, the higher the range. The more expensive you're gonna spend, the more performance you get. So at the moment, you have 3050, 3060, 3070, 3080, and 3090. There's also TI, or now they're calling it TI. I don't know why Nvidia is doing it, but there is TI or TI at the end. And what it means is it's a better version of that series. So for example, this 3060 TI is better than the 3060, but not better than the 3070. So it's like in the middle. So currently we have 3050, 3060 Ti, 3060, 3060 Ti, 3070, 3070 Ti, 3080, 3080 Ti, 3090, 3090 Ti. Yeah, we're in that world. Something to look out for is GDDR memory. There are recommended amounts to running higher resolution, multi-monitor setups, or certain workloads. If you want higher FPS in game or want to play at a higher resolution or combination of both, you should definitely invest into a better 
GPU. Also, if you're doing 3D animation that demands a lot of GDDR memory, getting a higher end GPU will make sense. Now that you understand the CPU and GPU, you need to ask yourself what am I using this PC for? If it's for general office work or watching shows, a media PC, then having an Intel Core i3-12100 with integrated graphics will save you lots of money because you won't need to get a GPU. If you need a workstation and you do 3D animation work, then a mid to high-end CPU like the 12600K to 12900K and having a GPU with high memory like the RTX 3090 would be good. Or if you need there's something better than RTX 3090 and it's not 3090 Ti. You can go with the NVIDIA Quadro RTX A6000 that has 48 gigabytes of memory with ECC memory. Most of you watching this probably won't get, I won't get it anytime soon. It's $10,000. I'm gonna guess that most of you are building a PC because you want to play games, right? But even gamers, there are many different types of gamers. If you're indie or party gamer, then an RTX 3050 or a GTX 1660 paired with the Intel Core i5-12400F will do. And going for a simple 24-inch 60Hz monitor will be enough. If you're a competitive gamer, especially for games like CSGO and Valorant, where having more FPS can give you an advantage, a better CPU like the Intel Core i7-12700K because CSGO is CPU intensive. And for the GPU, you can go for the RTX 3070 to RTX 3080 Ti. With an eSports monitor at 1080p, 240Hz, the Zowie XL2540 is a popular option. There is a reason why CSGO tournaments always use these monitors. And let's say you want the best AAA game experience with the best graphics for total immersion in the game. You're gonna want to go all out and get every last bit of performance. So having at least the RTX 3080 Ti with the i9-12900K and a 4K 144Hz HDR monitor like the ASUS PG32UQX will enhance your experience. But all these are extreme and somewhat simplified examples. It doesn't mean that having a competitive setup with a Zowie monitor means you can't play AAA games, or having a simple casual setup means you can't have fun playing Valorant or CSGO. This is why I say it's important to consider exactly what you'll be using the PC for. Otherwise, you might end up paying too much for what you don't use, or too little when you actually require more performance. Today's PC that I'm building will be a combination of work and play, but mostly work. It's actually for my new intern. <laughs> I don't need it to be the best of the best, but I want it to be good enough to be productive. So I'm choosing to go for the Intel Core i7-12700KF with the RTX 3060 Ti. I don't usually choose a specific GPU brand because I want to see what's available in the store first. Next, we get into motherboard, RAM, and case. The reason for choosing these three components is because they are dependent on each other. Choosing a motherboard determines whether you can get DDR4 or DDR5 RAM. And it also determines what kind of case you can get and vice versa. Motherboards comes in four main sizes, ITX, MATX, ATX, and EATX. Remember to ensure that your motherboard can fit into your case. If you choose a small foam factor case, it's a little more challenging because of the limited space for cable management, and some of them only take specific small foam factor PSU. Also, something to note, some cases come with fans and some don't. If your case doesn't come with fans, you have to purchase the correct size fans in addition to the case. And one more thing to take note about PC cases. If you want USB Type-C for your front ports, then do research if that case has it. And now more into the motherboards. With Intel 12th Gen CPU, you have these four motherboard choices. The H610, the B660, the H670, and the Z690. The main differences between these four motherboards are CPU overclocking support, memory overclocking support, RAID support and having faster and more USB ports. The choice of motherboard really goes hand in hand with your CPU choice. If it's an Intel CPU with a K at the end, then it's definitely the Z690 because that's the only motherboard that you can overclock your CPU. I would stay away from the H610 because it doesn't have PCIe Gen 4 for your GPU or NVMe SSD, and there is no memory overclocking support. But if you're using it for media or light office work, then it's fine. You can go with the i5-12400 or even the i3-12100. If you choose the i5-12400, 500-600 without the K, then the B660 
and H670 are bots to consider. For RAM, it's currently about the DDR4 and DDR5 RAM. The main differences is speed. It's really about price and availability. DDR5 is faster than DDR4, but the price currently does not justify the performance. But one day it's going to be really affordable. So for the sake of the future, I'll be getting a DDR5 2 times 16 gigabytes RAM. Now that we pick the CPU and case, we can choose the CPU cooler. There are three types of CPU coolers. Air CPU coolers, all-in-one CPU water coolers, and a custom water loop. For this tutorial, I won't be going into custom water loop because that itself can be a whole 30-minute video. So we are left with air and AIO CPU coolers. What's the difference between the two? Air coolers are more reliable and cheaper, whereas AIO coolers give better performance and usually have better aesthetics. You want to make sure that your cooler fits your case, so do check the case website for compatibility. Intel's lower end CPUs come with stock cooler. But the higher end CPUs will require a better cooler so they don't come with a stock cooler. If you're planning to overclock your CPU, then having a good CPU cooler is required. So an AIO with a 240mm or a 360mm radiator is recommended. If you plan to go air cooling, then go for a Noctua CPU cooler or a Be Quiet CPU cooler. Even if you're not overclocking your CPU, going for a good CPU cooler is beneficial for prolonging the CPU life. I want a clean CPU, so I'll be getting a 240mm AIO cooler. I'll pick the brand at the store. But if you have a particular brand or look you want to go, go for it. Next up, storage. You have three main types of storage, 3.5 and 2.5 hard disk drive or HDD, 2.5 inch solid state drive or SSD, and 3 M.2 NVMe SSD. The main differences between the three are physical size and read and write speeds. HDDs are the slowest reads and write speeds, about 80 megabits per second, and are less reliable than SSDs. Dropping a HDD from shoulder height will most likely damage it, but it's the most affordable. An SSD has faster reads and write speeds up to 550 megabits per second. The only reason for the limitation of speed is the SATA cable that needs to be connected from the SSD to the motherboard. And lastly, the M.2 NVMe SSD can go up to 7,000 megabits per second read speeds for Gen 4 and 3,500 megabits for Gen 3. An NVMe SSD is installed directly into a motherboard via M.2. That's why there's little limitations and there's no wires required and is the most expensive of the three options. Typically, a modern PC user will put Windows and softwares on a 500 GB NVMe SSD, install games on 1 to 2 terabyte 2.5 inch SSD. Reason for that so that your games load a lot faster than putting it on a hard drive. And if required, have a 4 to 8 terabyte hard drive to store everything else, pictures, movies, documents, all your downloads. But with the introduction of direct storage on Windows 11, games will benefit from faster SSD speeds. If you wish to future-proof your PC, then you will choose to have more NVMe SSD storage to store your games on it. So if you choose to get multiple NVMe SSD, do check that your motherboard has multiple M.2 slots. So like I said, this PC that I'm building is for work and gaming. So I want an 8 terabyte hard drive for my media storage, 1 terabyte SSD for games, and 500 GB Gen 4 NVMe SSD for Windows and my editing software. And last but not least, we have the PSU or power supply unit. It's what power your system. It's the food for your PC. Typically, there are a few things to look out for. Wattage, 80 plus rating, reliability, warranty, and modularity. To find out how much wattage you need, head on to your GPU website and in their specification, they will recommend you a wattage. What I like to do is add another 100 watts so that I have a little room for upgrades. So for example, the RTX 3060 Ti recommends 650 watts. I am going to get 750 watts. Also, if you're going for an i9-12900K, which can take up to 241 watts, then maybe having another 100 watts would be good. Yeah. For 80 plus rating, it indicates the efficiency of the power supply. For budget builds, I go for 80 plus bronze to save money. But for mid or high end, I go for gold. So if you want something really reliable, now these days brands give 10 years warranty. So look out for that. But if you're going for a budget build, three to five year warranty will do. Lastly, another thing to consider is if you want modular or non-modular power supply. 
A modular power supply will be more expensive, but will make things a lot easier when you build a PC because you can choose. You don't you don't need cables that you don't need in your case. You know. So what I will get is a 750 watt power supply modular. 80 plus gold. Now that you have all your parts, don't forget to write everything. I like to write it on a piece of paper because it's just a bit faster. But you know, if you want to put it on your phone notes, no, don't worry. So you put down your parts and do put down the estimated price. Uh, searching it online or on carousel. This will uh, give you a good indication how much you're going to spend. Because sometimes a particular component could be cheaper online. For example, hard drive. For some reason, hard drives online are a lot cheaper than Saving Square. Once you got the full list, it's time to either call a store that you know to ask about price. Or if you have the time, probably this is the majority of you that watch this video because this is like legit one part of the experience to shop in Singapore and maybe even Southeast Asia is to go to the stores and find the parts. It is half the fun. And of course, if you want to buy everything online, then I guess you can just skip to the build. But you will be spending a lot more money lah. Tell you first. And of course, this is Julian Tech TM. We're going to go to Sydney Square. So if you don't know what Sydney Square, Sydney Square is Singapore's biggest IT mall. And I already made a quick guide. So if you really want to know about Sydney Square, you can go ahead and watch that video but where the PC stuff are are usually at the fourth and fifth floor and that's where we are headed. So like I said in the start we don't have like a mega like IKEA of PC parts we have a lot of small stalls here and there and different stores sell different brands of components. So for example if you want MSI parts one store that I work with uh, VPC sells MSI parts. I don't have a particular brand I want today so the thing I want is the most value out of my money. So the best way to do that, in my opinion, is to just compare prices between stores. Remember the list of PC components that I told you to write down? That's where it comes in handy. You go to different stores and you just ask for quotations. Also together with your online price, you can just compare online price to store one, store two, store three. I already have a particular store that I like to go to, so I'm gonna go to that store today. So what I'm doing is I'm just writing down I mean, if you want to prep beforehand, you can. And here is where you can find all the parts that you haven't chosen yet. But it's exactly the same as what well, notebook, but without the online price. Thank you. What I didn't show is like, you know, you ask for a better price. The, the price that they actually gave at the start was a little bit more expensive than online. But that's because uh, there was some online price that I got really good deal, like the 8 terabyte hard drive. So, you know, if, if, if it's something like hard drive, and you think it's too expensive at the store, you can just get it online. Yeah, but yeah, at the end, I got a really good deal. So that whole experience took me about 30 minutes, but because I knew what I wanted, I knew how to shop, and it's only one store. So if you're going to multiple stores and you're gonna check prices, you're gonna take about two to three hours, depending if you can, depending on the time. If it's a Saturday, it's a peak hour, you're gonna take a bit longer. So now we're gonna go back with the parts and teach you how to build a PC. Okay, I'm back and the PC components are on the table. You can see a camera here because I wanna give you a first person's perspective so that you can build along. It's gonna be faster than normal because I'm gonna edit this, so you might need to pause and replay. But before we build anything what do we need before we build the pc screwdriver uh, i have one big one one small one they don't say what size this is but the big one will do 95 percent of the job the only thing that it can't do is the mvme ssd m.2 slot that's where you need a smaller screwdriver but if i'm not wrong i'm gonna put if there's any correction a size 2.5 screwdriver to do 100 percent of the job alternatively you can buy a set this is by Aurea. I bought the whole two bag. The main thing that it comes is obviously the screwdriver set that comes with uh, all the sizes you need, especially for a nut screwdriver. I will go into that later. It also comes with like a screw plate so that you don't lose your screw. Anti-static wristband. One other thing that you might need is a nut screwdriver size 5. M5. Why? For your standoff screws on your case. Typically, the standoff screws will already be installed in the case, but sometimes you might need to reconfigure the standoff screws. For example, if it's ATX to MATX, or sometimes they don't even install it for you, so you might need to install it yourself. If you don't want to get the, a set like this, pliers will actually do. It's, it's um, not very effective, but it will get the job done. A spana, a wrench, I mean, would do too. Anti-static wristband. How this works is that you wear the anti-static, attach this end to something that's Grounded. So what I have here is a PSU that's connected to the socket. Uh, I already prepped this before I started the video. But all you need to do is just add the anti-static wristband and just clip it to a metal piece of the PSU. Somewhere around the case like here and then you will be grounded. Alternatively, if you don't have an anti-static wristband, 
You can just leave the PSU on the side and just touch it before you touch your PC components. Highly recommended, especially when you have carpeted floors. Always good to be kiasu, kiasi, safe than sorry. So please do it if you can. Okay, so we can start with the building. So we need to prep our motherboard and CPU. So we take out everything that we don't need. It's recommended that you keep things neat so that you don't lose screwdrivers or components. Actually, let's put the RAM and the NVMe SSD because that's what we're going to add. So we prep our CPU, motherboard, NVMe SSD and our RAM. So we can put the CPU aside first because we want to prep the motherboard. So you want to hold it by this metal piece over here you can hold it by the two sides as well yeah so you can grab it by this metal piece you the thing you want to avoid is the ram slot the socket any of this heat sink this heat sink as well so yeah you can hold it like this uh, we might need some things from the motherboard box manual good to have so we're going to install hard drives and ssd so I'm going to need two SATA cable. Okay, so SATA cable I need. So I'm going to put it aside. I'm going to add one NVMe SSD. So I'm going to have one NVMe SSD screw. So it comes with the motherboard box and um, it's quite easy to misplace. So just be careful, yeah? Back the box. And what I like to do is to put the plastic on top. <laughs> Honestly, not needed. And then put the motherboard on top. Okay, then I'm going to orientate this so that you can see the front, right? You want to build along, right? Build along. So the first thing you want to do is to somewhat inspect and understand your motherboard. If you're not quite sure what is what, that you can refer to your manual. Uh, some things to look out for is uh, the top left, you can see you have one 8-pin CPU power and one 4-pin CPU power. So you can see here, there's also a fan header. Usually the fan headers are not here, so it's good to have. Uh, you see the CPU fan, you have a CPU op, 5 volt RGB, 12 volt RGB, you got your RAM slots, motherboard power, you got system fans on the right, you have the USB 3.2 header, SATA is on the bottom right, your battery is here, if you want to clear CMOS, front panel connector usually at the bottom right, uh, your pump, your fan pump for your AIO cooler is at the bottom, it's usually at the top. So it's interesting that this is at the bottom. So it's good to take note. USB headers, uh, more RGB pins, audio. And then you can see the P PCIe slots. One, two, three. We use the top one because that is the one with the most lanes. Uh, and then we have three M.2 slots. So we have one, two, three. Uh, we want to use this one because there is a heatsink. A uh, reason why we want to inspect and understand where is the headers is so that when you do your cable management, you know where to put the wires and cables so that it's a lot easier and you don't have to figure out when you put the motherboard in the case, which is a lot harder. So the sequence doesn't matter what you add, but usually I just like to add the CPU because it's like the most exciting. So you just unbox. I don't need to teach you how to unbox lah. Just take out. So this is the i7-12700KF. So it doesn't come with a stock cooler. But I will teach you all how to put in a stock cooler. I have a stock cooler at the side. So uh, don't worry. So we take out. Okay. So the first thing you need to figure out is where is the triangle? If you have it upright with all the words, it will be at the bottom left. And if you have a motherboard rotated right, it will be at the bottom left as well. So bottom left, bottom left. There we go. You can see the bottom left. Even on the bottom part of the CPU, you can see a very small triangle. For the motherboard, on the other hand, it will come with this plastic cover. And on the plastic cover, you will see the triangle. If your motherboard comes without the plastic cover, maybe you buy secondhand, it will be on the metal piece. It's a bit hard because there's a bit of reflection, but there is a triangle at the bottom left as well. You don't have to take the plastic cover out because once you install the CPU, plastic cover will come out automatically. I say automatically as though it's like a machine, but as in the pressure will pop it up. To release a socket, you have this metal piece. All you have to do is push down, go to the right, go up. Okay. And then you open up this way. So the pins are all on the socket. You do not want to touch it. It's gold. Uh, be careful here. Okay. First thing you want to do, take out your CPU. Hold it by the sides. You can see that is the divot on the left and right. If you go close enough to your CPU, let me see whether I can focus. You can see a notch. There's two notches. It will align to the socket as well. Okay. So I just want to have a better angle. Uh, you don't really have to do this. So what you want to do is just add it in. There shouldn't be any force. You just need to place it in. You don't need to put any pressure at all. Once that is installed, you just have to close the metal piece. There's this metal piece here. You need to push it down. And then that's where the plastic cover comes out. And make sure this top part latches on to the top metal piece. And this will feel like you're damaging something. But don't worry, there's supposed to be pressure. Okay, so there's a bit of pressure. 
make sure the metal bar is below this metal piece and you are set. So next we can add is the RAM. This is DDR5 RAM, but it works the same with DDR4. So installing DDR5 and DDR4 is pretty much the same. Uh, a gap here and there's going to be a notch and you have to align the gap to the notch. But what I like to do is to rotate it clockwise. The slot that you want to add is the last slot, the one nearest to the motherboard power and the second slot. So from the CPU, second and fourth. Important. These are the first priority slots. So what you want to do is to align on the left and on the right and put equal pressure Okay, I, it was the wrong orientation. So same thing with the other one. Last slot, equal amounts of pressure. Sometimes there are no clicks, it just happens. So just make sure that the notches at the side are locked in. Next, we can rotate it back to the original state and we can add the NVMe SSD. So I have here the Samsung 980 Pro PCIe 4 NVMe SSD. So it's up to 7,000 megabytes per second here. But before we can add in, we want to take out the shield for the M.2. So as you can see, the big screwdriver don't work. So that's where we have the small screwdriver. Okay, so we have the heat sink. You're going to need to take out the strap later on. So how you orientate the NVMe SSD, you can see there's the notch here and there's going to be a notch on the M.2. It's more obvious here, you can see here. And what you want to do is add it at a 45 degree angle. Okay, so I'll do it here instead. Same thing, 45 degree angle, push it in. Just make sure it's all the way in. That's where you get the M.2 screw. Just be careful, it's real small. Let's get a small screwdriver and screw it in. Most entry-level motherboard don't come with a heatsink, but if it comes, yeah, don't forget to take out the plastic. And all you have to do is add it back in. So what you want to do now is to just clear up the place so that it's not a mess. Especially, you know, if you have a small place and you don't have a lot of uh, room to build your PC, it's very good to neaten up the place so that you don't lose anything. Next thing we can actually do is to prep the CPU cooler. So I have here the 12th gen stock CPU cooler by Intel. Of, of course, you can see Intel. Ta -da, Intel. It will already come with thermal paste. It, I have already used it. So if you already have already used it, clear it, put new thermal paste. But if it's new, it will already come with thermal paste. And uh, let's imagine that this is new. Lah. All you have to do is just add it in. Legit, this is all you have to do. At opposite ends, just press down. The other, the other end as well. And yeah, that, that's basically how you install Intel CPU cooler. For the CPU header, just make sure, I've shown you at the top CPU fan header here. Just make sure it's connected. And then this cable, you can kind of hide it at the side so that it looks good. There we go. And that's how you add the CPU stock cooler. But this is an i7, we don't want just a stock cooler. We're gonna install the AIO water cooling. So to take the stock cooler CPU out, you can have a screwdriver and clockwise pop, it pops up, pop. There we go, super easy. Okay, so let's unbox the AIO cooler. So we want to just unbox everything. Unfortunately, third-party AIO coolers all come with different sets of instruction. You might not be able to follow one for one. So you need to go through the AIO manual. So even I have to do it because I'm not quite sure which is which. But the thing you want to do first is to add in the bracket. So for this particular bracket, there is a different set of numbers. There is 775, 115X, 1700 and 1366. So I want to go into 1700. So I make sure I change all of them to 17. Height, add it in to the bottom. Uh, this is how it looks. For this particular AIO, there is no screw on top. You just screw it directly onto the bracket. So the next thing you want to do is to add in your Intel brackets to the CPU cooler itself. And we can just uh, install the bracket. So actually, there was a bit of a complication. The screws that I was adding in was actually the radiator screws. That's because the screws for the mount was missing. So I had to use my own motherboard screws to add the mount. You can see at the top. Sometimes this kind of thing does happen. Missing screws, missing brackets. Um, you can go back to the shop, exchange. That's, uh, that's basically what you can do. Sometimes that's part of the fun, solving 
problems, right? Uh, yeah. Uh, so the next thing you want to install is to install the AIO to the socket. But first you need to add in the thermal paste. So why is the thermal paste important? Is so that there is a, a paste to transfer the heat from the CPU to the CPU cooler. So if you buy any cooler, it will come with thermal paste or thermal paste already installed to the CPU cooler. If you want something better than the stock thermal paste, you can go for something like a thermal greasy thermal paste. One step up and go adventurous a bit, liquid metal. We shall add in the thermal paste. There's a lot of methods. You can do the X methods, you can do the P method, the rice method, but you know what? Today, I'm gonna do line method. Hopefully you guys can see it. Line, 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 line. No, I put a bit too little. So I can put one more, like in the middle, like a small X. Or cross. Yeah, I think that's good. Orientation for the CPU cooler, it will really depend on which CPU cooler you get. Um, this one, it's like this. So I just want to screw it in a little bit, just so it's threaded in. Just uh, hand screw it first, make sure it's all aligned. So the next thing you want to do is screw in the CPU cooler. But you want to do it in a crisscross manner. You do not want to tighten just one part. This will give uneven pressure to the CPU, which is not good. So you want to screw this in a bit, then crisscross. You can go to the top right. Then you go to the bottom left. The first round, there's no tension. I can't feel any tension. Then the second round, I'll screw it until I feel a bit of tension. Then I can go to the next one. Once I feel a bit of tension, I go to the next one. And tension. Then the next one, I want to just tighten it a little bit. Don't want it to be too tight. Okay, tighten. 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 And tighten. All right, there we go. God, this motherboard is a bit weird. Like I told you, the, the pump fans are here. Give a bit of problems. This is for your 5-pin RGB, which is on the RGB header. But we do have a hub that comes with it so we can add in the hub later on so you know what i'm not going to add in any of the headers in and uh, the next step we can do is to prep the case so you want to unbox your case the best way to do it is to use gravity overturn it and just let gravity do its work All right. So the first thing I want to do is just unscrew everything. Different cases got different way of doing it. For example, like Lian Li, you need to take the top cover off before you can take both side panels. So the reason why you want to do this now is that it will come with some accessories. You see this accessory, you're going to need this. So the accessory kit comes with zip ties, very standard, a bunch of screws, some for your motherboard, some for like the SSDs the hard drives, uh, extra standoffs. And for this case, it comes with the tool. It's like a converter from Philips screwdriver to a nut screwdriver so that you can add in or replace any standoffs. Then other thing that you can take note is what uh, what cables you have. You have the front panel connectors, you have the audio connectors, USB 3.2. You have a lot of the fan connectors. So it has both Molex and the three pin header. So you can choose to just use Molex. Later, I will show you what's a Molex. You just add it in and all the fans will be working. Or since we have a hub, we can just use the hub and we can control the fan speeds from there. So the first thing you want to do is to put it on its back. Make sure not to crumple any of the cables that you have exposed. First thing you need to check is whether the standoffs are right. So there are three standoffs that are missing, which is in the accessory pack. So this is the standoff. And this is like the converter from Philips to a nut screwdriver. So usually cases will come with markings, whether is it MATX or ATX. For this, it doesn't. So if you're not sure, you can just double check on your motherboard, make sure everything is in. For an ATX, there's nine standoff screws, nine screws that you're going to add in. Okay, so since I told you there's three methods, right? One is this tool, I will use all three. So this is the tool. All I have to do is just add it in and you just screw it in. Yeah, easy. You want it to be tight, okay? Next method is if you have a tool kit, right? With the correct screwdriver. Then you can just screw it in. Simple. But what if you don't have any of it? Like the case don't come with it and you don't have a tool kit. Then you can use a plier. This is the most like inefficient way. You have to really just turn it. And sometimes you will scratch the standoff screws a bit. It's uh, normal. Let's say you don't even have a plier, but you have a wrench not recommended it is possible and you turn turn yeah yeah it works it works the wrench is actually easier than the pliers uh it's just inefficient not not the the best tool for the job but 
it does the job. So the next thing you want to do is to add your motherboard into the case. But I have a somewhat of a hack that I like to do because my hands are, are small and fat. So adding the CPU power at the top left of the motherboard is quite annoying for me. If you have a modular power supply, what you can do is get the CPU power. Let me see which one is it. CPU power. And what I like to do is to just add in the CPU connector. So one thing that I can um, figure out also is if I want the radiator on the top or at the side. I always like my radiator on the top and it looks like this case has sufficient space for the radiator to be on the top. This is especially why I want to put the CPU cables in first. For this particular motherboard, the IO shield comes with the motherboard so you don't need to add any IO shield. If your motherboard comes with a separate IO shield, that's where you need to add in the IO shield. You see there's a hole here. You just add it in. Pop, pop. Okay, it's a bit, it's a wrong side, but yeah, you put it like that and you put pressure in. Oh, I can hold it by the CPU cooler, making sure no cables are in the way. Lighting all of them up. Yep, looks like there's a good amount of space at the top. Very good. Yep, just put it on top here first. I can pull through this PSU cable later on. And now you can add in the screws to the motherboard. So there are usually three screws that come with your case. The motherboard screw looks like this. Like there's this like rim at the, at the sides. This one is a bit of like there's a hexagon shape. This one is mainly for your PSU. It's for your SSD or hard drive. Sometimes you need this for your SSDs as well. But this is for your motherboard. And this is where you add in the screws to secure your... That's not good. I drop a screw into the case. You definitely don't want to leave that screw in the case. You can short your motherboard and that's not good. It's definitely a lot easier when your screwdriver is magnetic. So what you want to do is just screw it in. You don't need to tighten first. Just thread all the screws into the nine standoffs. So I like to do crisscross so that it's all in place. Just thread it in. So it's all threaded in, now I just want to tighten. But the thing about tightening motherboard screws is you don't want to tighten too much. Once you feel a bit of pressure, you can stop. Because if you tighten it too much, you can bend the motherboard. After that's done, I want to pull through the CPU power first. We can actually put this upright, put this out. Uh, that's where you get your screws from your radiator box. So before you add in the radiator, so you can pull through all the cables while carrying your radiator up. Okay, so we're going to use the outer holes. So we actually can use either one, two or one, two. You want to crisscross the screws as well. For the CPU, it's important because you don't want to pressure it. For other components, it's so that you can thread it in properly. I said for the motherboard, if you tighten one part too much, then your other screw holes might not be aligned and uh, problematic all. And now majority of the building will be the PC upright. So the next thing we can add is the hard drive and 2.5 inch SSD. So different case got different ways of mounting hard drives and SSD. For this case, we can put the SSD here and the hard drives here. Refer to your case manual if you're not quite sure. So we can just remove this. I'm gonna add the SSD like this. And now I can tighten all four screws back in. Lock it in and... So for the hard drive, I'm gonna assume you unscrew the dubby from the bottom. Eh? No. Actually, you can just slide it out. You don't have to unscrew. You can just slide it out and pull it off. There we go. Yeah. So for this bay, you can either put the hard drive on top or you can put it in. The only thing you need to take note is if you attach a hard drive at the top, you have to screw it from the bottom. If you put it inside here, then you screw it at the side. So yeah, it really depends. For the hard drive, you want it to be pretty tight because the last thing you want your hard drive to do is to vibrate. You can just add it back in and then lock it in place. Yeah, very nice. Very convenient. So the next thing we can do is uh, add the PSU. This is the modular PSU from um, ASUS ROG Strix. 750 watt, 80 plus go, 10 year warranty. So the first thing we want to do is to add in all the cables we need. We definitely need the motherboard power cable. We already have the CPU power cable that we already add into the motherboard. So the other cables that come with it are things like Molex. Molex. Then you have uh, SATA. SATA power. Usually one cable has three to four SATA power. So we need about three. One for the hard drive, one for the SSD, and one for the fan hub. And last but not least, we have the PCIe for the graphic card. So usually one cable will have two 8-pin PCIe. So you see, that's two PCIe. 
8 pin. It's all labeled CPU, VGA, PCIe, motherboard, peripheral, SATA, Molex. So this is PCIe, CPU from the motherboard already. I'll put the SATA power, and have the motherboard. So next what we want to do is to add the PSU to the case, okay? Depending on the case, you might want the fan to face up or face down. So there is space here for airflow for the bottom so we can have the fan facing down. Alright, next you want to add the hexagon screw. You can do crisscross or solar. Okay, then you can turn this on so that you don't forget later on. So this is where it can get a bit overwhelming. There's a lot of cables, just make sure you know what is what. So because I already added the CPU cable, I just want to do a bit of cable management because it's already attached. This is something that I already cannot maneuver around. Okay, so here's the thing. The goal here is for you to add in the side panel without any force, you know, so that it's slide in nicely. So if you can see on your case, there are a few of these like hinge metal pieces used for cable management. And the rest here, you can just uh, stuff it in a bit. I mean, you can cable manage some more if you really want to make it look nice. But usually when there's space here, you can just push it in. So all these like fan headers, if you don't want it to be a distraction, you can just put it up first. I did talk about Molex just now. If you do not have a fan hub, then this might be the only way you can power your fans. If you choose to use Molex, all of this is already connected. You can see it's like in a chain. So just imagine that this part of the cable is into the power supply. All you have to do is just connect this and one part of the Molex, all the fan will be powered. You can't control the fans, but the fans will be turned on. We are not going to use that because we do have a hub. Because I know I'm going to use a hub, what I can do, cut off every part of it so that I can just have the three pin. I don't really need the Molex. I can just uh, take it away. If you think in the future you might need the Molex, don't cut it out. But for me, I just don't want to use Molex. This is the 3-pin. You can put it to your motherboard or a fan hub. And this is the Molex. So you can just cut it here. And then remove the Molex. So one thing I like to do is add the biggest cable to the smallest cable. So we have the motherboard power. Obviously, the thing to do is to put the hole nearest to the input that you need it to be. So for the power, it's probably this hole. Because let's see the other side. So for the motherboard power, it's going to be this hole here, right? And connect it. So okay, anyway, I decided to put the, the pump 3-pin header to the fan pump header. This is a very odd motherboard that the pump header will be at the bottom. Let's go back to the back. Uh, next one we can do is the SATA cable. Yeah, because it's, it's right here anyway. So this is SATA power and this is SATA cable. Okay, you need both of them for a hard drive or the SSD to run. The first thing we can do is just to power. Like I told you, there's four SATA for this cable. Then we can run it through here. Then we need one more for the fan hub. SATA comes in two connectors. They have the straight, which is the one on my left, and the L shape. So now we can put this SATA. All right. So I remember SATA is at the bottom right. Probably going to be in this hole for the SATA. So I just can just put it through first. So you can see the six SATA ports here. And then we can just add it to two of them. Two. There we go. So that's in. So the next thing we want to do is the front panel connectors. This will differ depending on what case you have. Some of them have uh, Type-C connectors, multiple USB 3 connectors, USB 2. Uh, but for this case, there's no USB 2. There's only USB 3, uh, front panel button connectors, and your audio. I know that the USB 3 is just below the motherboard power connector. So it's going to be this hole. For the front button connectors, it's going to be the bottom left. It's going to be a hole here. So I'm going to just leave it up here first. Let's put it there. The next is the audio. The audio is usually at the bottom left of the motherboard. So it's around here. And it's a bit hard because the PSU is already in. So we got to do a bit of a finesse. I'm not sure whether you can see it here. Um, that's where the audio is. Then we turn it, we can see where we have put all this thing in. Okay. So I know it's a little messy, but hopefully you all can follow. So we, we go from the USB 3 first. So USB 3 here, there's a notch at one side, so you can only put it one way. And then you just add it in here. Audio is usually at the bottom left. Not sure whether you all can see it there. Bottom left. Something to take note, audio and the USB looks very similar. But because of how the pins are, you cannot put the audio into the USB and you cannot put the USB to the audio. If you are forcing it in, whether is it the USB 2 or the audio, 
it's wrong. It shouldn't be so hard. You need to put a bit of pressure, but if you really have to put so much pressure, you're doing it wrong. Okay. For the front panel connectors, it's going to be a bit more complicated. So I'm going to change the lens so that I can zoom in to the front button panel connectors. If you look carefully at the bottom of the pins, you can see all the labels. You can see from the top left, there's a PLED, positive and negative. Below is HD, LED, positive and negative. Then you got power positive and negative and reset uh, negative and positive. For power and reset doesn't matter either way positive or negative but for the LED, HDD and the PLED, power LED, the positive needs to be in positive, the negative needs to be in negative. So you can see there's power LED positive, power LED negative, HDD positive and negative. Then we have here the power switch, the reset switch. Let's start with the power LED. Okay, so we see power LED, the, whole, the, the most top left. So we're going to put the most top left, just like that, negative. All right, so we have the HDD, positive is on the left. Positive is on the left, okay, so let's go with the reset first because bottom is easier to put first. It's a bit hard to see, but you should understand. Huh? And then last but not least, we have the power switch. Last one at the top right there, if you can see. This one can be a bit complicated, especially when you're new. So next thing you want to do is just like pull the cable a little bit, not too hard, so that it's just looking neat. You want to do this now because it's easier without the GPU. And then you know what? We can unbox the GPU. x 3060 Ti by Zotac Gaming. So you see, we only need one 8-pin power. What we can do here is for the PCIe is to cable manage a bit since we don't need this other half of the... PCIe cable. Then next thing we can add in the GPU. Just align the, the GPU to the PCIe to see which screw to take out. Just take this out. We're gonna need this screw, so we just leave it down. So we can take out the two brackets. Uh, just make sure, inspect the GPU, there's no plastic. All good. So we're gonna unlock the PCIe slot first and then align this in. Put your hand behind the case and just add pressure. There we go. That's why I call solid lah. Then we add back the screws. So for this GPU, because it's small and light, you don't really need to worry about holding the GPU when you add in the GPU. But when you have something like a 3090, once you add it in, you need to hold it up while putting the screw in because you're going to bend your PCIe slot. Uh, we want to add the power. This is something that you can take note. If you don't want to cover your GeForce RTX, then you can have the cable coming out from the side. Uh, this is really all dependent on your preference, what you... What you uh, what you want. Let me just do a visual inspection. Everything looks good. What cables are left? So we added CPU power, SATA power, SATA cable, SATA power, SATA cable, motherboard power cable. We got the USB 3, front panel connector, audio, and what's left. The only things left are the fans and the RGB. Obviously, the RGB doesn't really matter because it's going to be a closed case. But you know what? I'm just going to do it, okay? So this is where we install the hub. So the hub usually comes with double-sided tape at the back. So basically, uh, the hub on the left are fan pins and on the right and on the top are the RGB 5 volt pins. The one at the bottom is where you power the hub. So we have the connector for your power, user SATA like I said. You have the 5 pin header and the fan header. So this is going to be connected to the case. Okay, so all the fan headers are in. Next is the RGB 5 volts. So we have two on top for the radiator. We can take this out. Then we have one more for the CPU pump. We need to power the hub with SATA. Two more cables which are for the hub to the motherboard. Fan power connector, RGB connector. Okay, so I remember where are the connectors top right of the motherboard. This is not going to be the best cable management but I know it's going to be a top right so I'm going to just leave it up here. Hopefully I'm right. And I am uh, not exactly right. I put it up this top, but I can put it in this middle hole instead. So I can just redirect it. Okay, then just put it into the fan header. So basically this whole part is done. The only thing left is the cable management. But the thing is, what you want to do is actually just test the PC first, just to make sure it's running. If you do the cable management and something is not right, and then you have to re like 
take out all your cable ties to find out what the problem is. So yeah. So from here, you can tidy up your workspace, get a monitor, get a power, turn the PC on. So I'm going to do that. Common mistake that happens a lot when adding the HDMI or DisplayPort, make sure you connect it to the GPU and not the motherboard. If everything is good, it should turn on. Do a visual inspection of the PC, making sure all the fans and RGB is working. If it's not, go back and check the connectors. Once you boot to BIOS, here is where you can check all your components. Things to look out for, make sure all your storage devices and RAM are installed. Make sure the fans are all working. And lastly, the CPU temperatures are good. Actually, 45 degrees isn't very normal. Lo and behold, it's because I forgot to remove the plastic cover from the CPU cooler. But don't worry, it's an easy fix. First thing you need to do is power down the PC and remove the power cord. Then it's a simple removing of the CPU cooler, cleaning the thermal paste and reapplying thermal paste, then installing it back again. And voila, temperatures are all good. Next, cable management. Like I said, the goal is to close the side panel with ease. You don't really need it to be super neat because you're going to cover it anyway. But if you want to, I made a video about cable management and how I make it very neat. Now on to installing Windows 10, updating BIOS, drivers, and later on testing your PC. This method of installing Windows 10 doesn't require you to buy or activate Windows. This only works on Windows 10. You will need an activation code for Windows 11. You will need two thumb drive, at least 8 GB, one for installing Windows and another for buying BIOS and drivers. You will also need another working computer. If you don't have it, maybe go to a friend's place. On your other computer, go to Google and search download Windows 10 and click on the official Microsoft link. Head down to create Windows 10 installation media and download the tool. You can insert the thumb drive to the PC and now open media creation tool. Next, select create installation media. Choose the recommended settings, then select the USB flash drive. Now make sure you select the thumb drive that you want the installation media in. The creation tool, will format the drive. While waiting, we can prepare the other thumb drive with drivers and BIOS update. Google your motherboard and click on the official motherboard website, making sure it's the exact same model. Then you can hit to support, download the latest BIOS, then download audio drivers, chipset drivers, storage drivers, and LAN drivers. If your motherboard has Wi-Fi, you will need to install the Wi-Fi drivers as well. Sometimes your new PC won't be able to connect to the internet until you install the LAN drivers or Wi-Fi drivers. So these two are the most important things to put on your thumb drive. The rest of the drivers, you can do it when your PC is up and running. Now, unzip all the drivers and transfer it into the thumb drive. First thing I did was to update the BIOS. Updating BIOS improves stability and performance. Insert the thumb drive with the updates and in the Easy Bio menu, look for Q Flash. Then select your thumb drive and select the updated BIOS file. This will take some time. You can remove the thumb drive and add the other thumb drive with Windows. Now just follow the instruction, making sure to add your own language and location. In the Activate Windows option, if you have a Windows code, you can enter it here. If you don't, select I don't have a product key and select the Windows that you want for your PC, either Windows 10 Home or Pro. You can activate Windows later. Then lastly, select Custom, Install Windows Only, and select the drive you wish to install Windows in. Once you install Windows, if you don't want to log into your Microsoft account, don't connect the LAN cable in. Once you hit the desktop, connect your LAN cable or Wi-Fi. Now you can insert your thumb drive with all the updates and install them one by one. Then install GeForce drivers with GeForce Experience if you're using an NVIDIA card. You can choose to install the drivers manually if you don't want GeForce Experience. Last but not least is to do a stability test. I use three software, Core Temps, to monitor CPU temps, Cinebench to test the CPU, and Firmark to test the GPU. For the first test, I will open Core Temps and Cinebench. Head to the Advanced setting and select a 30-minute stability test and run the benchmark test. Run it for 30 minutes and monitor the CPU temps and clocks. Once that's done, open Firmark and run the test for 30 minutes. If your PC didn't crash, your PC should be good to go. If it crash, it's probably a heat issue. Double check your components if this happens and run the test again. And you're all set. So yep, that's how you build a PC. This video has been really tough to do, but it was fun. And right now, I'm in a new location. It's a, a temporary office. Ooh. Special thanks to Intel for sponsoring this video. Basically, Intel CPUs, whether you are entry level, high end, they got you covered. If you have any questions about building a PC or something is not clear, do comment in the comment section below. I will be sure to answer your questions. If you have more intricate questions or urgent questions, you can join my Discord. There's a whole community that will help you. But other than that, thank you very much. And I'm done. Actually, no. Let's have some bonus content. So the thing about this PC is that there is no Wi-Fi. So let's add some Wi-Fi for this PC. Yeah? There's a few options that you can have. You can just buy a dongle. That's USB, you just put in a USB. But we go PCIe. Come, cameraman, come. So to install, all you have to do is 
figure out which PCIe you're gonna use. There are four extra PCIe slots. Since it's a small PCIe, we can use the small PCIe slot. Place it in. All right, and then you can add in the antenna. Turn on. Thank you so much for watching and I'll see you next week.